The reason that we're holding the flash at that low angle is because we need to see shadows, right? This is one of the best footwear impression photos I've ever seen. It's not a crime scene photo. I did not take this photo. I wish, right? Because this is, this is Neil Armstrong's boot on the moon, right? So you can see the shadows and the impression. That's a, that's a phenomenal impression photo. And that's because it has shadows, right? It has shadows. What's that? Those are shadows. All right, let me show you some ones that are not so good. Ron, would you grab the lights for me, please? All right, so here are two photos, one that's really good and one that's not so good. Let's look at the first one, the one in the top left. Other one, please. All right, there is a footwear impression there. You can't see it. But you can't see it. Now, why can't you see it? Because you put it right, right above. above. That's right. The person who took this photo held the light directly above, and in doing so, completely eliminated the shadows. So now all we have is a great looking photo of dirt. Could you, do, if, if in a crime lab, if you were an examiner, and someone sent you that photo in the top left, and said, can you compare this photo to the suspect's shoes, what would you say? Yeah. What am I looking at? Because <laughs> yeah. all you can see is what dirt. Am I looking at? But looking at this photo, by the way, this is the exact same impression. Yeah. The exact same impression. Now you can see the footwear impression. By the way, is this a deep or a shallow impression? Shallow. shallow. Very shallow. So the angle for the light had to be what? Oh, really low. Really low, right? Yeah. But notice yeah. now we can see the impression because it has shadows. You guys see that? Same thing here. Here's a tire track. And by the way, photographing tire tracks and, and footwear impressions, the rules are the same. You photograph tire tracks the exact same way you photograph footwear impression. So here, two different photographs of the exact same tire track. By the way, these are some students last semester. This student, top left, did not do a good job. <laughs> this student in the bottom right, they did a great job. Same tire track. You know how you can tell? Because the piece of grass is in the same spot. Cannot even see the tire track in the photo in the top left, right? Great looking photo of that tire track. Why? Because this photo has what? Shadows. Shadows. Do you have a copy of that? <laughs> uh, I do. All right. Can you grab lights for me? I mean, like, for like, um, so we can see what we're supposed to I, I can give it to you if you'd like. Okay. Other cool. one, two, three, one, thank you. All right. Scale. When you photograph certain objects at a crime scene, it is necessary for you to take at least one photo with the scale. A very likely question on the final exam might be to name five things that you would take pictures of at a crime scene that you would have to take at least one photo that includes the scale. Let's see if you can name some for me. Obviously, one is what? Shoes. Footwear impression. What else? Tire tracks, fingerprints. Weapon. Any sort of weapon at all. Knife, gun, baseball bat. If it's a weapon, we need to know its size. Absolutely. Injury. Any sort of injury. So it's a cut on the body. It's a bruise, an abrade, any sort of abrasion, anything, any sort of wound at any, of any type on the body. Bullet hole, stab wound. We need a, a scale. What else? Do you take that scale and compare pictures? I'll talk about it in just a second. But let's, let's list off the, the things splatter. first. Blood spatter. Thank you. What else, Chris? Bone fracture. Yes, for sure. Any sort of fracture or even a bone fragment that you might find? Absolutely. What about broken? Yeah, so a, uh, you have a broken door, broken window, especially if you have tool marks near there. Those are all great examples. Bullet holes. Basically, if the size of the object is relevant, you need to take at least one photo with the scale. Now, we don't typically put the scale in the photo until we take our close-ups, right? So remember our footwear impression here was sitting here. We start with what? Long-range photo. Then we take our mid-range photo. Now we're ready to take our close-ups. Now here's the thing about photographing footwear impressions. We need to take multiple close-ups of the footwear impression. One of those close-ups needs to be taken without the scale in the photo. And there's a kind of a silly reason for it, but let me tell you what it is. It's to show that there's nothing underneath the scale, that I'm not trying to cover something up. Because that has come up in court, where we show a photograph, for example, uh, maybe there's a fingerprint, and there's a scale in the photo, and then the defense attorney says, well, what's underneath that scale? Are you trying to cover something up by putting that scale in the photo? 
Well, no. So then how do you get around that? Take at least one photo without the scale so you can show that there's nothing there. It's the truth. All right. Then we're going to include the scale in the other close-up photos. So if you're, if you're going to include a scale in the photos, you should take at least one without the scale, and then at least one more with the scale. So if I was photographing, I have a cut on the inside of my arm. You'd want to take one photo without the scale, and then one photo with the scale. So should you take, um, if you're taking a photo with the scale, no matter what, you should take two photos, one with and one without? Yes. Like, no matter what? No matter what the object is, one without, one with. Now when it comes to footwear, for close-ups, we're going to take five close-up photos of the footwear impression. One of those close-ups is going to be without the scale. Okay. So the first one we take of the footwear impression is without the scale. And again, it's to show that there's nothing underneath that scale that we're trying to conceal. Okay. Of footwear impressions, yes. So I have my footwear impression here. It should be broken this way. So the first photo, first close-up photo of my full impression, no scale in the photo. Once I've taken that first photo, now I'm going to put my scale in the photo. Now, these impression, these scales rather, are, are really designed primarily for photographing full impressions. All right. So I'm going to go ahead and lay this down next to, but not over top of, my impression. I want to get it as close as I can, but I don't want to put it over top of. So I'm just going to lay it down right next to, because I need it to be in the photo. Well, why is the scale in the photo? And this is, this is important to understand. The person who's going to be looking closest at these footwear photographs is going to be the forensic analyst in the crime lab, the criminalist. Because hopefully, we're going to have a suspect. We're going to serve a search warrant on the suspect's home. We're going to collect their shoes. And then we're going to make known impressions and prints of the shoes. And then the forensic analyst, the criminalist, is going to do a side-by-side -side comparison using your actual photographs and the prints they made of the shoes. So a side-by-side -side comparison, just like we do a fingerprint. Well, to do a side-by-side -side comparison, we want the photograph to be life-size. So what we're going to do is we're going to make an enlargement, right? We're not going to be satisfied by comparing photos that are three by five, right? If you ever take photos, let's say you go on vacation, you take a bunch of photos on vacation, and you go to you know, the photo place, you go to Walgreens, and they print them, chances are you don't make a bunch of eight by tens, do you? You probably just have small snapshots made. When we, when we make prints of footwear impressions, we make full enlargements. In other words, we're going to blow it up to life size. We're going to make what is referred to as a one-to-one -one enlargement. The term one-to-one, -one, I'll get to your question in just a second, Bill. The term one-to-one -one means that one inch in the photograph is equal to one inch. One-to-one. -one. So how do you know what one inch in the photograph is? Well, if there's a scale in the photo, a ruler, for example, that is in inches. You simply, as you're making your enlargement, you continue to enlarge it until one inch in the photograph is equal to one inch. That way when we print it and we're doing our side-by-side -side comparison, I make sure that I'm comparing apples to apples, oranges to oranges. Question, Dale. Why do you make a casting? Okay, the casting is a second way to do a comparison. I will tell you, in most cases, they're going to they're gonna use your photograph more than the cast to do the comparison. That's from personal experience. If you took good photographs, quite often the photographs are actually more valuable than the cast. Good question. All right, so we've, we've got our impression here. We took our long range photo. We took our mid range photo. We took one photo without the scale, and then we laid the scale in the, in the, the photo. Now, a couple things to remember. The scale. The scale needs to be on the same level or the same plane as the impression. Now, in Phoenix, that's not a difficult problem. Because remember, most of our impressions are really shallow, like less than an inch deep, which means I can simply lay the ruler right next to the impression on the dirt. But think about, what if you had a really deep impression? Let's say someone stepped in some snow and their foot sunk down in the snow six inches. I need to put the scale in the photo. Where do I put the scale? Yeah, I'm going to do that. Do I want to put the scale up on top of the snow? Right? Why not? Your perspective is the measurement. That's correct. So think about it. If we had snow, right? 
So let's say the top of the snow is here, but the impression is way down here. If I lay the scale up here, it's closer to the lens than the impression is down there. Remember, what are you using the scale to do? It's your reference for making your enlargement. If the scale is closer to the lens than the impression is, when you go to make your enlargement, you will under-enlarge it. You'll make a size 11 look like a size 9. And then if you do your comparison, you're going to look at the two and go, oh, nope, that can't be the right shoe because they're not the same size. So the scale and the impression need to be right next to each other. And so Anne is exactly right. If it was in the snow, I would need to dig a little trench next to the impression to get my scale so it's at the same level. So you can see that. Here's, oh, yep. Oh, sorry, too far. Boom, go ahead. So here is an impression in snow. And notice how they dug next to it and put the scale down there. Notice in the snow also, photographing snow is a pain in the butt because it's white on white. So one of the things we'll do sometimes when we're photographing in snow is we'll spray paint the snow. I thought that was boring. No, that's spray paint. <laughs> if you spray paint the snow, it's, it's easier to photograph. The other thing we'll do afterwards is when we go to cast it, we're not going to cast it with the typical dental stone. We're we'll actually use a spray wax to cast it. But just a little tip. For photographing in snow, if you simply take like primer spray paint, like gray, primer spray paint, spray paint the snow, and then you can take a picture of it that way. My parents got six inches two days ago. Yeah, my, my, my parents are snowboards. They're heading back to Utah today. I guess they got six inches up in Utah last week too. So. All right, what's wrong with this photo? It's over the side. That skills actually covering up part of the tire track, right? Stupid. Silly. Student did that last semester. Nobody knew that this semester. <laughs> All right. Now, how many pictures should you take of the impression? Well, first of all, let's make sure we're clear about the question, because you might get a question like this on the test. How many photographs should be taken of a footwear impression? Well, five close-ups. How many total photos should be taken of the impression? Seven. Seven. Because remember, before you do your close-ups, you need to take first your long range, medium range. Now, if the question says how many close-ups should you take, the answer is five. The reason you take five is because first, we take one without the scale. Well, then why four more? The reason for that is we're going to move the light source, right? So remember our flash here, right? We're going to use flash. We're going to attach it to the top of our camera. But what we're going to do for this is we're going to move the flash for each photo. I'm going to hold the flash in one of the photos with the light coming in from the west. For the next photo, I'm going to shift around. Now I have the light coming in from the south. And then I'm going to switch around. And I'm going to have the light coming in from the east. And I'm going to take another photo with the light coming in from the north. So one without the scale, and then four more with the scale, but with the light coming from each of the four directions. And the reason we take those photos from the different side, with the light coming from the different sides, is the shadows will move depending upon which direction the light is coming from. Ron, you had a question? Yeah. Uh, how do you get around the legs of the tripod? You've got to be careful. Make sure, because you don't want to get unwanted shadows. If I were to hold my flash behind the leg of the tripod, I would get a shadow cast across the impression from the leg of the tripod. So if I needed to, I could adjust the legs of the tripod, right? Or I could simply shoot the light through the legs of the tripod. You just have to be careful. That's a good question, and you're exactly right. Be careful. Yes? Yes, if I need to, yep, 100%. All right, so again, how many close-ups? Five. One without the scale, four with the scale, with the light coming from each direction. How many total photos? Seven. Seven. All right, good job. All right, I want to finish off by showing you some examples of good and bad photos. Ron, would you grab the lights for me? Actually, oh, oh, you got it? Thank you. Sorry, caught you. First of all, these two, both these photos are good photos. But the difference is, one is taken with the light coming from one direction, and another photo is taken with the light coming from the opposite direction. For example, this photo here, the light is coming from this direction. Right? This photo, the light is coming in from this direction. Both of these photos are good. 
Both of these photos are accurate. The, the reason I show you these two photos is notice in this photograph, you can see details here that are a little harder to see up there. Yeah. Why? It's because the light direction changed. Mm -hmm. So that's why we take photos with the light coming from all four sides. Because you'll see details in one photo that you would not be able to see in the other one. So we want to take photos with light coming in from all four sides. Both of these are good photos. There's nothing wrong with either one of these. The reason I show you them is you'll see details in one photo that you wouldn't have seen in the other. All right. Last thing I want to talk about. Fill the frame with the impression. What I mean by that is, it's okay, Ron, you're okay. What I mean by that is make the impression as big as you can in the frame. So zoom in. Zoom in. Make the impression fill the entire frame. So as you're looking through the eyepiece, make the impression as big as you can in the frame. Which also means, as you look through the camera, right, you can orientate the camera two ways. You can hold it horizontally, which gives you a rectangular frame long-wise, or you can flip the camera this way, right, so that you have the, the long portion of the frame going up and down. Orientate the impression so that it is going lengthwise across your frame. That's going to make the impression as big as you can possibly make it within the frame. Last thing, be careful of unwanted shadows. Just like Ron pointed out a moment ago, which was smart. If you're not careful, you can get shadows in your photo you don't want. Shadows from the legs of the tripod, shadows from the sink cord. Let me show you some examples of these. Right, these were last semester, a couple photos from some students last semester. What's wrong in the photo on the top left? All right, so we have a big shadow from the leg of the tripod there, right? Okay, horrible. All right, bottom left, what's wrong here? Okay, there's, there's actually a few things wrong. One, the flash. When you hold the flash, I'm not sure if you were paying attention, but when you hold the flash off to the side, you need to hold the flash a few feet away, about three or four feet away. When they took this photo, the student was holding the flash right next to the impression. You need to hold the flash a ways away so that the light can kind of evenly disperse and diffuse. If the light source is too close, you get this really bright area and then these darker areas. And then the other problem with this photo, did the student fill the frame with the impression? No. no this should be zoomed in so that the impression fills the frame, correct? Right, what's wrong with this one? What do we got in this photo? Bottom, bottom right. Sink cord. It has sink cords hanging down in the photo. What's wrong in the top right? It's just blurring out of focus. If you send that photo to me in the crime lab and say, can you compare this to the impressions of the suspect's shoes? I can't do anything with that, right? It's like having a sm a, a, an out of focus photograph of a footwear impression is like having a smudged fingerprint. I can't compare it. It's, it's no use. It's no value. I can't see the details. So when you take your photographs of footwear impressions, take the time to focus. Make sure you have good sharp focus when you take your photos. Otherwise, they're of no value. Make sense? Awesome. Ron, you grab the last one. So that's it. That's how we photograph footwear and tire track impressions. The only thing I would add is when we photograph tire track impressions, we're going to do all of the same things we just talked about. But we're going to do one thing when it comes to tire track impressions. I'm going to photograph a tire track impression. And keep my, a tire track impression might be 30 or 40 feet long. All I'm going to do is photograph it in one foot increments. I'm going to photograph each segment of the tire track like it's its own footwear impression. So if I had a, a tire track running down the length of the floor, I would set my camera up. And then what I would do next to the tire track is I would extend this tape measure. This would be my scale. And I would extend it along oops, the length of the tire track. And then what I would do is I would photograph first this 12-inch segment. I would photograph it from all four sides, just like I did with the footwear impression. And then I would pick my camera up. I would move it 12 inches. And I would photograph the next 12-inch segment. I would photograph it four times. I would pick it up, move it to the next 12 inch section, photograph the next section. Now, if I had a 30 or 40 foot long tire track, do I need to photograph the entire 40 feet? No, what do I need to photograph? One full rotation of the tires. 
What is equivalent to one floor rotation? Now, what is one floor rotation? It depends on the size of the tire. If it's a sedan, like a Toyota Camry, for example, one floor rotation is going to be about eight feet. If it's a big truck, one floor rotation might be 15 or 20 feet because it has a larger diameter tire. When in doubt, photograph about 15 to 20 feet, and you should be good. All right. So photographing tire tracks is just like photographing footwear impressions. We just photograph it in one foot segments. And then what I can do is if I take those photographs, I can lay them out on the table and put them side by side, and I can recreate that entire tire track. 